We continue on now with what is called modernity, or the modern period. Modernity, we could analyze its beginning around the year 1500. It's a time period of colonialism, the continued inquisition, a radical new means of dispersing information called the printing press, which allowed for um, the equal accessibility and improved accessibility to knowledge, culture, and information. It's a time period of revolutions, discovery of new continents and peoples, the splitting of the Christian church into Protestant and Catholic, as well as a time period for great art, not least of which uh, Shakespeare. So let's get into it. Last thing before we do. When we use the word modern in the historical or philosophical sense, we actually don't mean right now, the 21st century. Our world is a consequence of what is called the modern world. But historically, modern refers to the 1500s uh, up until about the 1800s or the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. After that, we specifically discuss uh, the 19th century, the 1800s, the 20th century, the 1900s, and now the 21st century, we might discuss the philosophy of the last 50 years as contemporary philosophy of our time. But modern refers to stuff that comparatively is you know, almost ancient, hundreds of years old at least. This map attempts to show human migrations around planet Earth. In 1492, when Columbus and the following conquistadors and explorers and colonists come into contact between the European world and the Native American world, those separate branches of the human family tree had been separated for tens of thousands of years. Our time period is a fascinating one because the human species has come back into contact with one another. Distant relations separated for eons, rediscovering one another. The context of this in terms of colonialism is chock full of all sorts of moral uh, problems genocides, oppression, uh, warfare, uh, all of that that your history teachers have dealt with and uh, philosophy can and does deal with as well. But what I wanted to deal with is a uh, moral, historical, and political point as well as epistemological. Oh, we could throw in metaphysical if we wanted to as well too. About an idea that I had first heard when I was a young man, a teenager in high school. I had a friend who had a family member that expressed to me the following idea. And it's a white supremacist and uh, racist idea. But this was an idea he had and thought was worthy of discussion. At the time he expressed this sentiment, I didn't know how to respond. But years later, I would discover what the answer to his question was. 
what this man had suggested was that the reason colonialism happened one way rather than the other, namely, the reason why Europeans colonized the Americas instead of Native Americans colonizing Europe. What this person expressed was his prejudice that it was because of an inherent racial superiority that explained that occurrence. There's an anthropologist by the name of Jared Diamond who writes a book titled Guns, Germs, and steel. Which provides an answer that contradicts this person I had come in contact's hypothesis of racial superiority. That white people were superior to others and thus white people made better things and did things better. It's white supremacy. What Jared Diamond's book argues is that there's no inherent racial superiority which explains why colonialism happens one way rather than the other, but instead an accident of geography. This occurs on a couple of levels, the first of which is that it's far easier to trade from Lisbon in Portugal to Beijing in China because you're traveling east to west in the same latitude. You can wear a light jacket all the way across Eurasia, as Marco Polo would have done. But if you want to travel and trade from Juneau, Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, South America, you have to cross uh, tundra regions Tundra regions, temperate zones, not to mention the mountains, which would have been an issue in Asia as well. Uh, temperate and then desert areas, rainforest and penetrable jungles, uh, more rainforest and penetrable jungles, back through temperate zones uh, into tundra zones again. So that trading north to south was much more challenging than trading east to west across Eurasia. And Jared Ar Diamond argues that for that reason, European and also East Asian cultures developed more rapidly than did Native cultures, Native American cultures. When the conquistadors came, they came with uh, muskets the gunpowder for which had first been understood in China. It was borrowed through cultural transmission, a technology that Europe didn't come up with its, itself, but borrowed from its neighbors because of the ease of trade. Whereas the Europeans had advanced to Steel Age technology, the Native Americans were still living in Stone Age technology. Not because they were dumb, but because of the ease of travel and therefore the rapid cultural development east to west across Eurasia, rather than north to south across the Americas. Not only this, but because of this east to west trade and uh, intermixture of populations and peoples. The European uh, conquistadors and colonists had exposure and were carriers for a wider variety of diseases that the Native American populations, having less interaction north to south because of the difficulties we mentioned, had no resistances to. 
And so by some estimates, the population of the Americas went from around 100 million native peoples before colonialism to around 10 million after. Imagine living in a world where 9 out of 10 people died from diseases through no fault of their own. Just bad luck. If you were one of these people, you might think the gods must hate us. But it's not that the gods hated the Native Americans. It was just an accident of geography. The Europeans had been exposed to and were carriers for more diseases. Combine with this uh, Jared, Diamond, Jared Diamond's argument that there were a number more easily domesticated animals throughout Eurasia than in the Americas. The Arabian stallion, for example, with the conquistador in steel armor uh, with a rifle or a musket, compared to a Mesoamerican with a llama. The llama, or alpaca, does not make a very effective um, steed for war. As cute as that would be, um, the Europeans had the benefit of advances, or a advantages, um, just through sheer dumb luck. Or at least, that is Jared Diamond's argument. So that it's not racial superiority, but instead the accident of geography that made the difference in the history of colonization. Likely such a meeting would look something like this. And the mixture of colonialism with missionary work, the desire to convert native peoples to Christianity, theoretically for the benefit of their souls, was destructive to cultures. And when the native populations wouldn't convert, wouldn't give up their culture, and wouldn't give up their land, the conflict quickly turned military, with predictable results. In 1517, there is a schism in the Catholic Church. A schism means a split between what would come to be called Catholicism and a new offshoot denomination called Protestantism. Lutheranism at first, and then others would develop. Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation because he had significant criticisms of the corruption of the Catholic Church and its clergy most well-known was his criticism of the practice of the selling of indulgences. Indulgences are sins that are pre-forgiven or licensed. And what Luther criticizes is that rich people would go to the priests and uh, bribe them because of their wealth, to allow them to get away with something guilt-free. So a rich person might go to the priest and say, Dear Father, I was thinking of sleeping with a prostitute. If I donate a considerable sum to the church, would we be good? And the significantly corrupted priesthood would accept the money and let him off the hook. You are pre-forgiven, my son. The Catholic Church had one other issue at this time, 
which was that it had become considerably corrupt. What the priests realized is that they could do whatever they pleased. The priests, which were supposed to be celibate, some of them were having orgies and wild sex parties in the cathedrals. Because they could do so, and it didn't seem that God would punish them. They could get away with it. And these two factors, combined with a number of others, are far too much for Martin Luther to put up with. That isn't the essence of religion, uh, Luther thinks. And so, he's a reformer. Uh, he takes the Catholic Church to task. He's attempting to return the Christian social ethos to its original roots. And in the process, spawns a wave of Puritanism. Christianity, in Luther's mind, is about being ritualistically pure, which the considerable corruption of the Catholic Church at that time appeared to have gotten away from. This Puritanism uh, has a lasting effect down to today, uh, which we well know. And so I won't belabor the point and instead continue on to other relevant developments at this time in history. One would be John Calvin's doctrine of predestination or predetermination. Both of these are forms of determinism, which is the philosophy that events and actions are absolutely and necessarily determined by prior events. John Calvin's logic is that if God is omniscient, that is, all-knowing, then God must necessarily know everything that's going to happen before it happens. Supposedly, from before the beginning of creation, that omniscience would require God to ultimately know who is at the end going to end up in heaven and who is going to end up in hell. So that free will is at best an illusion or at worst non-existent. This is a debate that can go back and forth um, to infinity. There are all sorts of arguments presented by all sorts of people on both sides of this. So we don't need to uh, trouble ourselves with the detail of necessarily trying to figure this out right now. Perhaps omniscience and free will can go together. Perhaps they can't. It's an interesting argument. Um, and doing the argument is a little like playing chess. There's lots of intricate moves and some you win on and some your opponent wins on. But at the end of the day, you're right where you left off. And so, since it doesn't ultimately change our daily lives, how we go about answering this question, we'll leave off it for now 
as a uh, historical philosophical curiosity. What is less of a curiosity and significantly more historically, politically, ethically, um, and culturally relevant are the writings of Niccolo Machiavelli. His text from 1532 titled The Prince is an unassuming book by itself. But it contains within it an idea more radical and revolutionary than any we have seen so far. Likely more revolutionary than any we will see for the rest of the semester. Machiavelli provides us a different idea. The intellectual history of philosophy, the conglomerate of world cultures, and especially the history of the Western world, though not exclusively, has in large part been the history of idealism. Confucius was an idealist. Have the political rulers be good and the people will be good. It's naive and idealistic and therefore impractical. It's probably not how the world really works people tend to try and get away with what they can get away with. And often, in large part, it works. If we want to understand how the world really works, we need Machiavelli to bring us up to speed, to usher in and inaugurate the Enlightenment and a turning point in the history of ideas. Which represents a transition from being idealistic and naive to being practical and perhaps effective. The question is, at what cost? Ultimately, The Prince is a political treatise on how to rule well. I've attempted to summarize it as follows. The text itself, in my opinion, is dry. To the point of being boring. But just beneath the surface. I argue is something like um, radioactive waste. Machiavelli's philosophy will melt your face off. This is very likely to destroy the person who attempts to um, manifest it or to, to use it in their daily lives. But it's also insanely powerful, extraordinarily powerful. It's the sort of thing that can provide power for a thousand years or wind up with everyone dead. And you may notice there's not a single other idea I've expressed in any terms such like that. So what's going on here? 
here's my paraphrasing. That for Machiavelli, there is no moral basis on which to judge the difference between legitimate and illegitimate uses of power. Rather, authority and power are essentially co-equal. Whoever has power has the right to command. But, and this is important, goodness does not ensure power. And the good person has no more authority by virtue of being good. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Thus, in direct opposition to a moralistic theory of politics, Machiavelli argues that the only real concern of the political ruler is getting and keeping power although he uses the phrase maintaining the state. These ideas have been reduced to the simple statement that might makes right, or that the ends justify the means. Now, what do I mean by a moralistic theory of politics? This was the idealistic idea represented in the concept of the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings that we had discussed uh, characterizing the Dark Ages was that God picks and chooses rulers with the implication that a devout and pious king would be rewarded by God with a long uh, reign. Whereas an impious, corrupt, and evil king would be punished by God with a very short reign. And what Machiavelli figures out is that that's not actually how the world works. Good kings are overthrown because they never want to step on anybody's toes. And corrupt, evil rulers can rule with an iron fist for generations. So that it doesn't seem to be that the good are rewarded and the bad are punished. But instead, the opposite. That the bad are enjoying the benefits and the good are being punished. What this helps Machiavelli realize is that being a good person doesn't matter in politics. Let me say it again so that way it sinks in. For Machiavelli, morality is unimportant. And that's it. That's what's so very different. Socrates, Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, all the Christian saints, For all of them, morality is the most important thing. Machiavelli, wily character that, it is, that he is, comes in and simply says, Nuh uh. And there's something there. He's got some idea, but it is a dangerous idea as well as a debatable idea. 
there was a discussion in Plato's Republic that we only briefly mentioned dealing with whether it's better to lie, cheat, and steal if you can get away with it rather than to be a good person and make more slow progress. Socrates, Confucius, and Buddha, and Jesus, all argue it's better to be a good person even if no one's watching. Machiavelli provides the counter-argument. What's important is to make it look like you're a good person, to appear to be moral, and then to do whatever suits you best and provides the best end result for you. He argues one should appear to be Jesus, to be the perfection of morality. But then, behind the scenes, if you're cunning and conniving enough to get away with it, to lie, cheat, steal, and backstab your way to the top. If you want to be Jesus and forgive everybody and never punish anyone, if you're a political ruler, your people are going to walk all over you and you're going to get overthrown. He argues it's better to make an example of people. Have them be scared of you. Even if it would be more ideally moral to forgive. If what we're really interested in is staying in political power, one should use whatever means necessary. And when this includes superseding the Christian ethic, so be it. You might notice that this lays the possibility for tyranny, which it absolutely does. This philosophy makes the argument that ethics and moral behavior is a prison built for the minds of the weak. And that the person in charge can't and shouldn't be bothered by such fetters. In personal terms, this philosophy of do whatever you want to do so long as you don't get caught is insanely dangerous. Machiavelli ends his life in uh, poverty. Apparently he wasn't cunning and conniving enough for this to work out to his benefit. But rather than on a personal level on an intellectual level, it does help us understand a number of features of the world around us, perhaps better than the ineffective idealisms had. That is, ineffective um, in terms of explanatory power. To make sense of why the world is the way it is. We might ask, why are politicians always so corrupt? Painting perhaps with a pretty broad brush. 
Machiavelli helps us understand because it works. Perhaps even because they have to be. Because it's more effective to accomplish the goals of politics. That is a troubling idea. And it might not be true. But it also might be. This also helps, makes a, helps us make sense of a number of other political and historical uh, curiosities. First off, in our current world, it helps us understand why the American police force must always win. Because the second they don't, everything's back to square one. We no longer have a society. For that reason, the police always have to be stronger, always have to outgun the citizenry, always have to have more men, uh, more troops, and can't just give up and not chase down the bad guy. This should expose that there is a myth that the point of the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is to be able to protect yourself from government tyranny. There's a wonderful legal journal article titled Arms, Anarchy, and the Second Amendment, which exposes in Supreme Court case history that this interpretation of the Second Amendment has zero basis in reality. You don't ever have the right to shoot back at the government. Perhaps you uh, hold that as a human right, but not as a constitutional right. You don't get to shoot back at the police. That's not how it works. And furthermore, it's a myth that that would ever be effective. No matter what sort of personal arsenal and armory you exercise control over, or how many buddies you think are on your side, there will always be more police with more guns and more toys and more drive. Because if there's not, society is over and we restart and there's a vested interest on the part of the government in not doing that if the police forces of the United States of America could not take you down they would call in the National Guard and the military with the tanks and the bombs and the night vision goggles. You don't stand a chance. This is an interesting point too, um, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Machiavelli also helps us to understand the ethics of political revolution. That's what might makes right means. For George Washington and his rebel buddies to overthrow British colonial rule, had they lost, would have been treason. They would have been executed as traitors 
and remembered uh, by history as traitors. But because they had superior force, strength, or might, they're heroes. They're moral. They're good people and role models. Thus, they gain moral authority because they had the military strength to install themselves as political authorities. Untangling that is a fun one. This also, to a large extent, explains why the American military always wants to win. The reason is the same. If we don't contain, uh, 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 if we don't remain in military control, if we're not a dominant military powerhouse, if we lose the might, we might lose the right. Well, by which I mean specifically our moral authority. The minute there's someone stronger than us, the minute the military backs down, people can come uh, criticizing our uh, past morality in terms of our uh, foreign actions, specifically. So long as we're the most powerful military in the world, Machiavelli's argument would imply that we also have moral authority in the world. Because we can back it up with tanks and bombs and guns. And the minute we don't is the minute the questioning of our moral authority can quite easily turn into litigation or even um, an existential fight for control of our existence as a nation. There's one final realm, in addition to the personal, the law enforcement, the foreign military policy uh, dimensions this uh, has relevance for. There's also, uh, in intellectual terms, the ability to make sense of this might makes right, or the power that might makes right has to be explanatory. During the time period of the Inquisition, the Catholic Church was able to maintain its moral authority by using its political and forceful ability to silence its critics, to torture, to excommunicate, to execute dissidents, the non-believers, heretics. Its political and military power protected its moral power, and vice versa. But as the Catholic Church and the Christian Church as a whole loses its power to explain why the world is the way it is, it begins to falter in terms of its moral authority. And that too is characteristic of the Enlightenment. First, it's Copernicus and Galileo who start to point out, actually, 
when you look at it, the universe doesn't appear to look to work the way the sacred scriptures say it should work. The Bible is losing its explanatory power, and at first the church can intimidate or kill its critics. But over time, the power of science forces the Catholic Church to cede or give up some at first small and over time growing amount of its moral power and moral authority. By the time that Darwin has a more powerful or mighty explanation for why we're here, the moral authority of the church is nearly in tatters. If the church doesn't have the strongest explanation for the facts, why should we listen to its supposed ethics? And if science has a more mighty explanation, a more powerful explanation for why the world is the way it is, perhaps we should look elsewhere for our moral guidance. We'll see over the following few videos this decreasing explanatory and then moral influence of the Christian Church on European culture. Which brokers the opportunity for new ways of doing anything, of doing things. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Enlightenment. All of these are intertwined theoretically. Or perhaps intellectually. In our next video, we'll try to follow some of those threads as they weave their way down towards us in order to understand how the centuries of the Renaissance or modernity lay the foundation for the modern world we find ourselves in today.